symptoms of spine problems. History is the most important component of patient evaluation. Once you get the history, you will establish a tentative diagnosis and an initial differential diagnosis. History will guide the physical examination and will help to select the appropriate diagnostic tests. If the patient comes to the doctor and complains of unsteady gait with vague motor and sensory symptoms that been there over a long period of time, and the patient complains of impairment of the fine motor function, such as difficulty in buttoning and unbuttoning the shirt, then think of cervical myelopathy. Then you probably want to examine that patient for pathological lung tract signs, such as Huffman, Pepineski, and Clonus. History is extremely important in degenerative disorders of the spine. So when the patient complains about pain that is associated with activity and is relieved by rest, and this pain is becoming progressive and worse over the course of the day, then this is a mechanical pain. Mechanical pain can indicate instability or disc problems. If the patient complains of pain that's non-mechanical, meaning the pain does not occur with activity, it occurs independent of activity, with the pain being worse at night, and it is not relieved by rest or by immobilization of the spine, then ask the patient about a history of weight loss or any constitutional symptoms. The patient may have infection or a tumor. Also, try to determine if the pain is radicular or axial. Is the pain going to the extremity or is the pain localized to the spine or both? In case of radicular pain, the patient will complain of pain that's associated with parathesia numbness, and weakness in a dermatomal distribution. This radicular pain usually indicates a herniated disc. For example, the patient may have sciatica, and the patient may have pain from the spine going down to the lower extremity, to the lateral aspect of the heel. That will indicate there might be a disc herniation at L5-S1 involving the S1 nerve root. In this case, with the patient that has radicular pain, we need to examine the patient carefully and we need to check for tension signs, such as a straight leg raising test, contralateral straight leg raising test, or femoral stretch sign. It is the irritation of the nerve root, probably due to a disc herniation that's causing the patient symptoms. If the pain is in the spine and not radiating, then it is an axial pain, and it is usually diffuse. Check to make sure the patient does not have a tumor or infection. Pain from cervical spine disorder can be referred to the shoulder or the scapula. Shoulder pain and neck pain overlap and can coexist. In case of lumbar spine disorder, the pain may be referred to the buttock or to the posterior aspect of the thigh. Check for concomitant pain such as cervical spine and shoulder, or lower back and arthritis of the hip. There is association between lumbar stenosis and the arthritis of the hip. Both can coexist. It is called the hip spine syndrome. And if the patient comes to you complaining about 
hip pain. Ask the patient to point where is the site of the pain because that hip pain may be far posterior, which indicates a sacroiliac joint or the pain may be coming from the lower back. History also can be important in case of coda equina when the patient complains of low back pain. Always ask the patient if the patient has bladder or bowel symptoms. Bladder or bowel symptoms can be associated with coda equina. It is important to obtain that history of bladder and bowel symptoms. Early diagnosis and treatment of coda equina syndrome is mandatory. Coda equina syndrome is a medical emergency and it must be diagnosed quickly and treated urgently to avoid long-term serious complications. In coda equina, the symptoms are usually bilateral and symmetrical. There will be sudden onset of more back pain than radicular pain and the sensation over the perianal area is affected. If you suspect coda equina, you need to get an MRI immediately. Another situation where history is important is cervical myelopathy that is associated with lumbar stenosis. If the patient comes to you with the low back pain and during the interview, you ask the patient if the patient has a staggering gait, which can indicate cervical myelopathy. In this case, you may need to get an MRI of the cervical spine in addition to studying the lower lumbar spine and the causes of the lower back pain. In case you can get an MRI because the patient is very obese or have a defibrillator, then myelogram with CT scan can be used. History can also help in differentiation between lumbar stenosis and disc herniation. In lumbar stenosis, the symptoms can be bilateral and the pain is non-specific. In disc herniation, there is always unilateral symptoms. In lumbar stenosis, the pain does not go below the knee. In disc herniation, the pain is unilateral according to the dermatomal pain pattern, depending on the nerve that's affected by the herniated disc. Diagnosis of lumbar stenosis basically depends on the patient history and the physical exam does not show much. History is the key in making the diagnosis for a spinal stenosis. The pain is worse with standing or walking and is relieved by rest, sitting, or by flexing the spine. Clearly, the leg symptoms and not the back pain will point towards lumbar stenosis, especially if the patient has buttock pain. If you suspect lumbar stenosis, always examine the pulses and compare both sides. In neurogenic claudication, which is heaviness and cramping of the calves, the patient will walk a certain distance and then get the pain. The patient then has to stop and sit down. Once the pain goes away, the patient then can resume walking again. Neurogenic claudication is seen in about 50% of the patients. Vascular disease and vascular claudication the pain will start distal because there is not enough blood going distal and goes to proximal because the circulation is poorest distally. Vascular and neurogenic claudication may coexist. In vascular claudication, not moving the legs or not moving the muscles relieves the pain.
Postural changes like flexing the spine will improve the neurogenic claudication, but it will not improve the vascular claudication. Always think about referred pain from other areas, such as pancreatitis, pelvic inflammatory disease, cholecystitis, and kidney stones. Check if the patient has a history of trauma. We need to apply the ATLS protocol, the airway, the breathing, and the circulation. We need to identify the mechanism of injury, and we need to examine the patient carefully for the presence and the location of pain and for the presence of any neurological symptoms. Check to see if the patient complains of a deformity of the spine. Check to see if the patient has any pain in addition to the deformity of the spine. In adult patients, pain associated with deformity of the spine can occur due to fatigue of the muscles and later on it occurs due to degenerative changes of the spine. Thank you very much. I hope that was helpful.